here, Sid Kai is, is very proud to award the Social Impact Award to Laisha Palin. Um, Laisha is a professor of computer science and the chair of information science at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, and I wanted to say just a little bit about the Social Impact Award. When I looked at the definition of this award, it said it's given to individuals who promote the application of human computer interaction research to pressing social needs. And I thought that combination of applying original research to pressing social needs was a really apt description of Laisha's contributions, where she has done great research in the area of, of crisis informatics, a field that deals roughly, I'm going to let Laisha define it in great detail, it deals with how people use information and communications technology to deal with crises and what could be more of a pressing need than that. So please join me in welcoming Laisha. Hi everyone. Thanks Lauren. Um, thanks to the Kai community for this award. As you will see in this talk, um, the inroads that we have made in this area, area are the result of many, many hands. So I'd like to begin by offering my simple working definition of what crisis informatics is. Um, crisis informatics is a study of information and communication technology in relation to actual or potential mass emergencies with a particular focus on the role of social computing in such situations. Now today's social media is one large class of social computing technology and its advance has brought major attention to the nature of large social movements which include disaster response though we don't often think of disasters in quite that way. I've been working on developing this field for the past decade, starting just after the December 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, but before Hurricane Katrina hit in the U.S. that following August. Mobile phone diffusion was finally high in the U.S. after lagging behind the rest of the world, but the U.S. still did not have pervasive data services, so in the U.S. we were not texting, believe it or not, still in 2005, not, not greatly. The very first camera phones were making their appearance in the summer of 2005, but again, this was happening outside the U.S. And the world over, there was very little in the way of social media in the way we think of it today, and we did not have that term available to us. But the stage was set for significant change. After having worked in the area of mobile telephony and social computing in a range of what we call everyday environments, as you know, I began to wonder what could be possible when there was a collective turn to a set of time and safety critical needs. In what situation could the very idea of collaborative technology be put to the test more so than during the massive social disruption of disaster events? Katrina came along and started showing us what that could mean. Before that, I spent that spring semester camped out in the University of Colorado Natural Hazards Library um, to looking for the conceptual, theoretical, and methodological connections between our home field of human computer interaction, my other home field of computer supported cooperative work and social computing with what is a rich social science literature on collective action and social convergence in relation to disaster. So what I'd like to do in this talk is accomplish a couple of things. So what I'll do formally is outline the field of crisis informatics as I see it today, really kind of you know, from my point of view, but trying to imagine the concerns of many. Um, but I want to do that by way of telling the story of how it came about through um, collaboration. I include this as part of the account, not just because uh, acknowledging the contributions of others is the right thing to do, of course, but because I think um, I'd like to have you consider how the diversification of skill sets had direct bearing on this field's course and to whatever extent it has achieved it to its success. So at CU, this work grew from one investigator basically to soon after my very first group of graduate students. And you will know these folks, and Sarah Buick is here. I don't know where she ended up. There she ended up. Um, and these, uh, these folks are now at universities and research institutes and government agencies of their own doing um, some terrific work expanding this work even further. Um, in, in 2009, a large NSF grant expanded and intellectually diversified the faculty base at CU, um, as well as with um, our partner, University of California, Irvine, with Gloria Mark, whom many of you will know. Um, but other than Gloria, these were not HCI faculty. These were people in our people in computational linguistics, software engineering, telecom policy, and so on. 
And then uh, more students, including uh, Joanne White and Lee St. Dennis, whose work I'll also be talking about today, who are getting ready to graduate shortly, and the many students who are affiliated with these other faculty um, themselves who are intellectually diverse, as all people are. But I would like to make the point that I, found, I have found that these, our students have come from a range of disciplines in their bachelor's or master's degrees to, to come work in this area, and I think that's really has led to the richness and I think the broad impact of the work. Um, uh, new cl faculty collaborations with the last two years have further diversified our portfolio, if you will, with colleagues in civil engineering, communication, and environmental design, and with the National Center for Atmospheric Research with meteorologists, meteorologists who themselves are trained as, um, also trained as social scientists. And then I have to um, recognize two of our colleagues that you will know from the CHI community, Irina Slavsky and Alexander Sarsevic, who did postdocing with our group over these 10 years. And the newest wave of people working in this area um, are our terrific set of PhD students, including two who are here at CHI this week, Melissa Bika and Robert Soden. And Robert Soden will be speaking later on Thursday. I'll tell you more a little bit about that so you can have the opportunity to attend, attend that talk as well. And so you can see this has been a real coalition of effort across disciplines, a lot of cross-disciplinary advising and interaction and co-authorship that I think has been an important part of this account. So together we have published and studied research on events, uh, the events listed here in this rough timeline, and collected data on many others, social media data basically, but other data kind of as well. And, if, and we've of course published across events as well. We've theorized about issues that aren't driven by events alone. And in total, our group has produced over 70 papers, dissertations, and MS uh, thesis documents in this, in this time frame, which I'm really proud of. And we've had a commitment to making this work available to a very, very wide audience, which is mostly good, but actually introduces some concerns that we have to think about when we think about what, what happens when our research can have impact. And I'll talk about that in just a second, including, as well, a very large practitioner audience. And this, again, is, I think, a central objective in our, in our research. The development of this new area would not have happened without the generous support of the U.S. National Science Foundation, and it's here again that I'd like to make the point that the diversification beyond HCI allowed for the diversification of grant sources that then was able to fund that work and then became kind of this virtuous cycle. So we've been able to seek not just funding from the Computer Science Directorate, which in the American context is where much HCI research is funded, but also in the Engineering Directorates and in the Geospace and Geotechnical Directorates. And so, because this problem, as you could imagine, is, is pretty cross-cutting. And so, again, I, I just want to state how valuable this has been to building and sustaining momentum to allow us to really drive in a dedicated fashion towards a topic that I think, I think um, deserves, deserves that kind of attention um, and, and having that kind of reach. And as I reflect on what's happened, I see how the HCI sensibility played a persistent role in all of this, even though there has been a great deal of specialized leadership across our group and across time. And it gives me pause because I often think that the role, and I'm speaking a little bit, I'm speaking for myself, and I'm maybe pro perhaps projecting a little bit onto you, but I think it's fair to say that many of us often feel that HCI, when we're trying to collaborate on large, far-reaching projects, it's often tacked on as kind of something that's in service to others. And I think this happens in both research and industry. Um, and I think perhaps in resistance to that, sometimes we find it easier to collaborate with people who are much more like ourselves because we believe, or at least I believe, that there is basic research to be found in HCI itself. So what happens if we went a step further and consider what could happen when the HCI sensibility leads multidisciplinary projects? What happens when it leads different disciplines within engineering, uh, computer science, and different disciplines within social science? And I think what happens is that because we have the training that we have and the um, sensibilities that we have, we're able to carefully articulate a set of research questions that can set a course for ambitious cross-cutting research. So what I'm going to be offering today in this talk is a structure for how to think about the field of crisis informatics as it exists today. 
um, and it came about from the doing of it. So it's a very inductive way of looking at the field and looking at the, all the products of the various groups now that are working in this space. Um, and I hope you see that HCI sensibility coming through in addition to the mix of all these other disciplines. So before I get into this, though, I need to do a couple of acts of staging, one of um, discussing in a little bit of detail, actually, what our epistemological commitments are to this area. Um, and it's, this is also an idea I've been kind of trotting out and playing with, and I hope to do more of it this summer in um, at some other venues. But I think it serves both the purpose of seeing what you think about it, but also then kind of, again, situating ourselves there. So that's the one act of staging. The second act will be to then move into the disaster area as a domain and then do some articulation of some differences I'd like you to be aware of there before we then talk about the five branches. So um, I see currently that there are three major epistemologies in HCI. I'm willing to be wrong about this and have this further refined, but just for the purposes of being clear about where we are um, and where I am, this is how I see the world. Um, and uh, I see first as empirical research as a major epistemological stance of HCI, and this is in general what we most associate with the sciences. And so many of us, I think, still in HCI um, feel the need to um, work in reaction to uh, different forms of empirical work to justify, say, critical HCI, for example. So this is, so even with an HCI, this is a very dominant um, kind of stance. Critical studies and theories are what we most associate with the humanities, but we're seeing more and more of that in, in, in HCI. And then this uh, term that I like so much, research through design, which is a newer phrase, and I believe Jody Forlisi and John Zimmerman are the ones to credit with that term. I think it's a new term, but it reflects this, uh, I think, an, an, an ongoing commitment that we we've long had, that the ability to understand things first comes through the creation of things, especially if they're, they don't have analogies for whatever it is that's being created in, in the, that already exists. Our group, um, and uh, imagine that I, I live in a computer science department, so I have to explain this often. I work and speak to different emergency manager groups, so I have to explain this quite a bit too, and so I'm perhaps doing a little over-explaining here, but uh, I'm just gonna go with it for now. Um, but we're strongly empirical. Um, I think as our group is growing and, and diversifying, we're, we're starting to bring in more critical uh, analyses into the work that we do, and I think perhaps I underestimate how much critical analysis we do, because as you'll see when I talk about branch one, I feel that what we've done is sort of um, abolish with the typical tropes that we assume um, are, is the story of disaster. And you can't do that if you aren't taking a critical view. But then we move very strongly into this kind of empirical view, uh, empirical uh, research that then follows. So, um, Let's, so let me just further dive into this empirical form of inquiry. And this is going to develop as a matrix, as you'll soon see. So in empirical science, we have positivist and interpretivist forms of inquiry. Positivist, very simply, forms of inquiry is what we most strongly associate with the sciences. Many of us are taught the scientific method in school. It's what we think of when we think of experimentation. The goal of positivist research is to prove knowledge. And so what we have there is hypothesis testing. But of course, what happens when you don't, what, when you don't yet know what knowledge needs proving, well then you find yourself perhaps um, wanting to align more with interpretivist forms of inquiry. And it's also empirical, it's also rigorous, as many of you know. Um, it builds knowledge, it formulates thesis statements, it's data-driven, it's highly inductive. Um, and I think the base building work that we've been doing in crisis informatics falls mostly into these interpretivist, an, an interpretivist line of inquiry. And um, and, so, and then there's what this means to HCI. And so this is where the matrix comes in. Um, I think there are two ways to describe um, the goals of HCI, and that's summative and formative. Um, and summative research is to study something that is pre-existing or has already occurred without deliberate intervention. Whereas, um, and there can be, and, and summative research can be either positivist or interpretivist. So, whereas positivist research asks, does X, for example, influence Y and how much? Interpretivist summative research asks, how does, how does X influence Y? Um, in HCI, in particular, we have very strongly, I think, formative goals where the research uh, is meant to 
uh, be conducted in such a way as to inform the design of artifacts, but also policies, procedures, and so on. And it's this idea of formative that drives that, you know, the very familiar ACI tenets that we espouse of iterative design and engaging with users. That's the formative research that we are committed to, or many of us are committed to. And this too can be either positivist or interpretivist. So positivist formative work might ask, does this design choice have some effect? And that's where A-B studies will sit, right? Large-scale A-B studies, for example, among others. Um, interpretivist formative research might then ask, well, how does this design have an effect? And so I would say that in the work over these 10 years, there are examples of where we've worked in most of these cells at one point or another. But we work, I would say, in this interpretivist line of inquiry primarily. Um, and we work in this formative interpretivist um, uh, point of intersection. But certainly, interpretivist summative is the most dominant in my work personally. Um, and, and the reason I'm making the point of saying this is one to kind of, again, situate the work, suggest that this field is a growing field, that we're trying to discover what the problems are and how to articulate them best to then do s subsequent work, design work, other kinds of interventions, and so on. Um, but I would also like to say that it constitutes basic research, and this goes back to a little bit of Lauren's introduction. And the reason why I feel it's important to say this is that I think the social impact of our work is really important. But I think, I think even I thought not long ago that to have social impact, one had to be very, sit very closely to applied research, which is not a bad thing. But as it turns out, I think it's very possible, and in fact, an obligation of scholarship in the world today to conduct basic research and imagine what the impact can be by carefully sort of monitoring and imagining what those translation efforts will be. So one can do basic research and have social impact. That's, that's, the, that's, my, that's my argument. Okay, um, I'd like to set the stage once more by distinguishing between, um, I, to, I would like to now enter into the discussion of the, the, the different kinds of crises that we might consider and what do we mean by crisis. And um, before I talk in further detail, I want to make the, the distinction between hazards with exogenous versus endogenous agents. Um, my group has worked across a range of hazards, actually both kinds of hazards, but our biggest contribution has certainly been in examining social media behavior, social computing behavior in relation to events that have exogenous agents those that cannot be apprehended or easily apprehended, like a hurricane, like a tornado, like a big terrorist act that, that apparently comes from the outside and cannot be immediately dealt with in the event of the experience of the disaster um, as it's being lived in that moment. And this is a juxtaposition to endogenous agents, agents that are from within. Um, and this often means that there's a perception that it can somehow be stopped. And so often this behavior is perceived as criminal, okay? so. Um, the reason why this is important to um, distinguish is that I think it has significant impact on what we understand the online, online crowd to do. It also has impact on what the offline crowd does or the in-place crowd, but significantly I think it has even greater chain effect on the online crowd um, because people, there's such a large observant audience coming sometimes from the whole world looking at some of these major events. So one example is the Virginia Tech shootings, uh, which is something we did examine with Sarah Vuig and others that you saw on the screen earlier. And in that event, it was the names of those who were killed or injured who was, was the subject of what the crowd was trying to search for. Um, and I note the shooter was set at the scene there, so there was nothing to apprehend at that point. Um, in the Boston bombings, it was the pursuit of the perpetrators that was the salient problem. That the, and, in, and as many of you might know, the crowd got that wrong. The Reddit community got that wrong to great detriment, actually. Um, and so with endogenous agents, the system drives itself towards the apprehension and identification of in individuals is a general statement I'd like to make, but I think it's an empirical one that can be that can be something worth examining even further. Um, but in general, I observe that the character of the interaction between people online and with the perception of the agent is quite different, and it drives towards issues of blame, justice, and forensics. 
In the case of natural hazards or other exogenous agents, there are lots of problems to solve. It's a much more diffuse kind of information and question and answer kind of environment. There are, the, the problems are still significant. They're not necessarily minor, but there are just so many that it divides the crowd's attention, right? So the crowd is doing lots of different kinds of things. And so therefore, this online crowd then structures itself differently. The social structures are different in these different kinds of environments. So the field of crisis informatics, should it continue, and I hope it does, um, should address a whole range of hazards, like all the bad things that can happen, right? I mean, that's <laughs> the, but like, you know, war, bombings, pandemics. But now that the field is maturing, and um, I think it's important that we make a distinct, a distinction between the expectations of a field and the expectations of a lab, or the expectations of an author, or the expectations of a paper. Um, and so now that we have such a wide audience, people will read one paper and try to make some very broad implications from that without appreciating what these concerns are. So in other words, just because there is all this behavior occurring online when bad things happen, doesn't mean that it's all the same thing. It doesn't mean that there should be a singular interpretation of what's going on, of course. Um, and it's actually a very technologically deterministic view of things, to, to think such things. Um, and I think because crisis informatics uh, research is now being read by a very wide academic and practitioner audience, it's being misread because readers don't understand this, even just this distinction between different kinds of agents, and even authors do not understand this distinction. So though there's this wonderful story, perhaps, of impact of this field, there's now, off, now this thing that we have to be very careful how we tread and how we communicate to our audience what it is that we mean and what the impacts are, and return, in fact, to some basic ideas in HCI like technological determinism and, and other things that I'll be talking about in just a little bit about how about what and how this means and how we do our research. So the core phenomena of interest, just, just to reiterate, is not social media. The core phenomena are the different kinds of hazards. We should see different kinds of collective action and information seeking into in relation to different kinds of events, and we do. Okay, so now as I turn to the five branches of crisis informatics, what I'm going to be doing is um, I'm going to animate them with examples largely from um, our own work, which again is mostly about exogenous agents. So the branches I think still stand up even when you talk about endogenous agents, but the branches, I've written them for this talk in such a way that they don't dictate what the results are. They describe the different topics within this field that could be examined. So some of the results I'll use to animate the ideas might be in contrast to other events that you've read about or perhaps you yourself study. So this would just be another conversation that we would have about what, about what, the, what, what, what the study of these different uh, branches might mean. Okay, and I think that's one of the consequences of having done this work for a while and being able to have the privilege to be able to be dedicated to it for a while is that we can make those distinctions that we, and that we should make those distinctions. Okay, so the five branches in overview are this. First, I'll talk about social computing as it's perceived in relation to professional emergency management and why it's hard for emergency management to adopt. Second, um, I will show how uh, a second line of research capitalizes on the spontaneous social media activity that naturally occurs in response to disasters and what people are trying to do there and what the problems and opportunities are there. Third, I'll talk about the challenges of collecting crisis data and the, how, uh, and specifically, I mean social media crisis data, and how the collection is already a kind of sampling decision that limits the kinds of things that can be done down the road and how that's another point of caution about how we're going to read and conduct this research going forward. And then fourth, I'll spend the most time summarizing the internal social structures that arise online in response to disaster events. But I will come back to, in a sense, branch one, with how what happens, nominally speaking, online is, has connections to emergency activity in the physical world. This is a point I bring up here because we've been, this is a criticism that's been leveled at us pretty severely about, you know, you know all this stuff about what's happening online, but how does it help people on the ground? And so I'd like to talk about that both as a summative and formative kind of um, research enterprise, and so we'll close there. 
Okay, so to help keep track, I've color-coded each section. So this is the blue section. Uh, and this will uh, help you keep track of where we are in the talk. Maybe even will help me keep track of where we are in the talk. Uh, as, and some of the topics, as you'll see, some of the ideas are overlapping, and often deliberately so. But this will help you keep track of where we are. So... Um, what I'm about to talk about now, I'm eventually going to the ideas of how this affects professional emergency management. But to the extent that perhaps some of you in this audience are not familiar with disaster, um, I am also imagining that, in a sense, we, the general public, belongs in this category of concern, too. And it's here where I'd like to dismantle the tropes of what disaster response is and how people react to it and the bearing that has on social media and how we study that. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so let me start there. Okay, so crisis informatics as a research field disrupts more comfortable frames of reference about who does what in disaster. So when we consider technology solutions or impacts, we must expand our understanding to go beyond what formal, formal responders need these emergency responders you see here, perhaps in terms of situational awareness, which is, of course, something that everyone's trying to achieve, and emergency managers are trying to achieve to have an overview of the situation, to know what's going on, to be able to make decisions about where resources are going to be allocated, because in disaster, that's a necessary condition. A disaster is a disaster if the problems ex exceed, outstrip the resources that can be allocated to solving that problem, right? So hard problems have to be made, you, and you make them by having an overview of what's going on. So situational awareness is this holy grail. Um, but we have to go beyond this and recognize that people on the ground who are victims of disaster are trying to do the very same thing. They are still trying to figure out what to do, even when bad things happen to them. So look at what they did here. Here, um, in the, in the uh, aftermath of the 2005 Hurricane Katrina and then Rita, which closely followed, they took one of the few walls in the huge Houston Astrodome, which is a big sports arena, um, to make it a bulletin board for missing persons. And they did no pictures. Remember, they had no phones, no camera phones. They didn't know they were going to need the pictures. If they had them, there wouldn't have been a way to print them out and put them out and distribute them. So they're all just torn off pieces of paper and cardboard. Um, these bulletin boards, this is a really natural phenomena, at least certainly before the advent of ICT. Um, and these bulletin boards happened everywhere across the region in the more than 111 official Red Cross shelters, but also in other public places, hotels and other public areas across the U.S. Gulf Coast region. And it's the best they can do under the circumstances. Now, it probably didn't work out very well as a way to find people unless it unless these photographs themselves by FEMA helped, perhaps. Because the only people who could go into these shelters were the people who were authorized to be in the shelters. They were all tagged with wrist tags, right? So it's not entirely clear who they were advertising to. But, as Sarah Vuig once said in one of our lab meetings in 2007, people do this thing, do this kind of activity, because they're desperate. It's a desperate move, right? So. They know that this isn't going to be the way they can solve their problems, but they're striving to find, they're absolutely, it makes the point that everyone is striving for situational awareness. Everyone, even under their very limited impoverished circumstances, information impoverished circumstances and otherwise, are striving for situational awareness. So social media does two important things to this landscape. First, it expands the audience to get outside that shelter. So here are tweet reports that are geolocated and, and envisioned here on a geo-earth representation from the Google Person Finder database, and they're represented as tweets. And these were the missing Person Finder people reports following the tsunami in Japan. Okay? Um, it's the same behavior, but now there's potentially a global audience to assist. Second, social media exposes the informal work conducted by the public. And because we are trained in HCI and perhaps CCW, we know that the very idea of informality is, in, is important to understanding real life. And of course, I, we have to think of Lucy Suchman's contributions and her colleagues um, uh, and her work in Plans and Situated Action that states this so clearly. But the idea is that what we say we will do does not reflect how things get actually, actually get done. This is an important idea to keep in mind when we build technology or we build policy or especially when we build policy about technology because all of that is an artifice, it's a construct built on rationalized logic about how things 
how people do things and how people, things should be done. But because it's so much easier to design for things how should be done than how they are done, of course, what happens is we miss all this very important informal work that has already happened in disaster, has always happened in disaster, but digital traces expose it to us in new ways. So when we think about disasters, which we know are not part of anyone's plan, um, we have to really think about even we who are trained in this kind of thinking, what, what we're doing when we bring our own kinds of biases to this problem. So I, I love this photo. I find it extremely moving, um, and I think it illustrates this point really well. So here we see the public um, mixed with formal response. You could tell by the, the clothing that they're wearing. In the rescue activities from the 2002 earthquake in Turkey, which was a devastating earthquake, they have many devastating earthquakes, but that one was particularly bad. Um, and here we see this blend of formal and informal roles at work here, and we see orderly, cooperative work, even though it's clearly improvised work, right? It's not planned work. Nobody was planning for this. The lesson here is that we simply will, will be willing to hear once again and for this context that informal roles and informal work exists and that they accomplish important things. Such an understanding counteracts the myths of victimhood and other false depictions of public conduct in disaster, especially those with exogenous agents. Contrary to what you see in the movies, people are not panicked, they are not in a daze, they are not looting. These are things that get magnified hugely. If we continue to think about disasters as things that need to be policed because people are perceived as helpless and therefore suddenly somehow dangerous, then we aren't, first of all, doing a humane job in responding to the disaster. And second, all this energy about what we think, about what we think the problems are is being misplaced. So if you've ever been in a disaster event yourself, you will know this. Terrible things can be happening around you. Terrible things might be happening to you. But if you're not an injured victim, and maybe even if you are, you are still assessing a situation. You're still making decisions. You might be distraught. You, but you still have your brain. Um, you are still acting based on your ongoing analysis of what's going on, on around you. You never stop being smart, right? So my point is this. If we believe the movie version of disaster, we bring those ideas to the social media front as well, and it's another, which is another place of social convergence. We magnify the problems that we imagine must be there, and the more we do that, the more we are distracted by things like bad information without really understanding what it is we mean when we say bad information, that it deserves its own analysis of its own. And we aren't characterizing that very well, and therefore we can't solve those problems very well if they're there, even as we imagine them. Um, and then, of course, we miss this fascinating stuff, the version of this that happens online. So our group has done a great deal of work with emergency managers in a participatory fashion in various ways over the years. And it's pretty clear that the problem of adoption of social media for them is, is bigger than most imagine. A lot of criticism is leveled at emergency managers for being slow and not quick um, to, to adopt new technology and being afraid of the new technology. And of course the problems are actually far more complex than that. There's real issues of liability that they have to navigate around. So how do they suddenly, again, have to make decisions when they have fewer resources and problems they have? And if they turn to social media, can, we, can they be assured? How could, when the state of the art is lagging so far behind them, them being able to get a situational awareness kind of depiction of what's going on, they have to be very cautious about making decisions in relation to it. And that's a very kind of simple, simplified way of looking at the array of things that they're facing, but that's, I think, a fair a statement to say about what the, what the critical issue is. But I believe that this will come about through change, and it's going to come about uh, through changes in practice. So I think of all the things that we have looked at, I think the, the point, the, the most fundamental point, can be boiled down to one takeaway lesson here. And that's that changes in, changes in social media policy, and they do exist, even though they're partial, um, will come about through changes in local practice. And I have a four-tweet excerpt from Hurricane Sandy in 2012 as it was rolling in and making landfall in the, 
the U.S. Um, Eastern Seaboard that I think brings this point home really parsimoniously. So this was a part of a set of research that was presented by Amanda Hughes and Lee St. Denis at CHI last year. So um, we have four tweets. This is, the first tweet is by the Fire Department of New York. These are reproduced exactly except where I had to anonymize a little bit of information as you'll see. Um, and FDNY says to, announces, makes this declaration, please note, do not Tweet emergency calls. Please call 911, which is the emergency line in the US. If it's not an emergency, please call 311 and then some hashtags. And by the way, hashtags were born out of disaster itself. Um, we credit Chris Messina, um, who invented the convention of the hashtag in the, um, at, in the wake, in the experience of the 2007 Southern California wildfires. So that's another message in all this, is that disasters are sites of innovation. So um, not even an hour later, about 45 minutes later, somebody writes directly to FDNY and says, my sister's family is at this address, water's rising, 12 feet, need help, phone number, first floor drowned, kids scared. FDNY writes back a couple minutes later and says, please keep trying to call 911, we see the first hedge, I, I will try to reach dispatchers now. So. She's started, the policy is already starting to erode. We're not even an hour in to the event yet. Um, and then many tweets go by. There's lots of interaction. I'm showing you an excerpt here. FDNY writes back not three hours after the initial declaration and writes to a number of people and says, don't want New York City to rely on this as an alternative to 911, but notifying dispatchers of all emergencies tweeted. So, this is the point. Change happens in these socio-technical systems and all systems, really, um, through bottom-up processes, bottom-up practice. It's not a top-down one. So this is situated action, situated cognition in action, and this is how these things work. And this is how we'll see change. Okay, branch two. The biggest point of entry, I'm moving along because I have too much for this talk, so I, I should actually probably speed it up even a little bit more. So um, the biggest point of entry into this space is this idea of how to drive leverage, leverage is a common word, leverage and drive data from the naturalistically occurring social media streams in the wake of disaster. And it brings a lot of people into this problem space, even uh, certainly those who, you know, may or may not care about, say, social science commitments to the problem space. And there, um, I, I am glad for it, actually, because this is going to be a um, multidisciplinary solution. It's going to be a whole field solution to figure out how to deal with two major constraints for good data derivation. And that's through, um, that is the optimization for speed and the optimization for comprehensiveness. And we currently can't do both. That's the holy grail. Um, and so we have to think in the meantime, as we're, as we're trying to contribute to this, as others are trying to solve this problem along with us, um, and in application of other domains, we ask ourselves in our group, well, what can we do to derive data that's helpful to responders, but that it's still rapid when things are happening, but doesn't get us into ethical dilemmas when we can't be comprehensive about reporting how many people are injured, for example, or dealing with the absence of information that we don't know yet know how to quantify or qualify what that means. The absence of information could mean somebody's in fact really hurt, not just that they can't be heard, right? They could in fact be really hurt. Okay, so, um, so one area that we've done some work in this area, uh, it was, we've tried to uh, apply this compromise is in the area of geotechnical reconnaissance. Uh, geotechnical reconnaissance, and so this is work we do with civil engineers and with uh, the Department of Transportation in the U.S. and environmental design. So geotechnical reconnaissance is when ge gear teams, geotechnical extreme event reconnaissance teams, deploy to disasters around the world. They're international teams. They deploy to disasters internationally, you know, five to six people to study the impacts of hazards on the built infrastructure naturalistically. So like us, they want to use the world as their natural laboratory to get accurate, accurate portrayals of the hazard load on the physical built environment. But the mobilization of international teams is challenging. It's expensive, I mean, more than usual because there are no flights into that area. Flights are canceled, flights are booked, there are no hotel rooms, there are no rental cars because they're all taken up. That's what happens in disasters, this massive convergence of tons and tons of people. So it's really hard to get into a disaster site even if, uh, even if it's not the transportation that's being compromised. Um, 
it can sometimes be dangerous. So there was a team that was going to planning to deploy to Japan after the tsunami there, um, but the risk of radioactivity um, curtailed what they were trying to do. Um, and it can be just so easy to get wrong. Um, how do you deploy a team of five to six people to study the isolated spots of soil liquefaction that occurs after seismic activity? When what you want to know, you want to be able to see these places of liquefaction to be able to see what the effects are on the building structures, right? And that might, will then have future effects on the building codes and new forms of engineering of, of our infrastructure. So how do you, how do they find those points of liquefaction along a 600 kilometer fault line? Um, so the idea is, uh, and also I should say one more thing, is that cleanup begins right away, even in most devastating earthquakes um, and disasters. So, so you can't take these measures if you're not there right away. So the idea is to use social media um, to help the teams navigate within the highly diffuse events in the geographical space, so kind of having some intelligent navigational paths that, then, that also then say, by the way, don't go that way as you normally would. You have to go this way because the road is um, damaged. Um, but also to use it as a proxy for when you can't be everywhere at once, which, which you can't. So we tackled this using our own flood case. So in Colorado in fall 2013, we had a massive, massive flash flooding. We had an annual, a year's worth of rainfall in four days. So we had flash flooding everywhere. And this is the kind of topic, as you might imagine, that if you really want to do meaningful work, you often have to be there. And so alas, it came to us, um, and we were able to conduct a series of studies then that, that then that were much like this. So these photos that, uh, this, these two photos I'm going to show you um, illustrate the kind of data they are after. So this is water rushing down what turns out to be a multi-use path. So you can see, I'll just show you the before and the after. And it, I don't know if the resolution on this projector is showing you, but there's just sheets of rain coming down. Um, so this is the kind of data they are after, and so what we did was we quickly extracted videos and photos and overlaid those data with floodplain data, uh, satellite imagery, other kinds of data to use a, as a case. It was really a formative design kind of study to imagine what we could do to support this geotechnical reconnaissance. Um, the open circles that you see here are known places of bridge flooding, and the closed dots are the tweets that we were able to locate nearby. And with this, we can retrieve, obviously, the co tweet content and verify it relative to other things that we see, like the satellite imagery. But we also learn who the Twitterer is, or the, who the Twitterers are, right? And that's valuable, because if that person's located nearby, we can contact them. Uh, if that person's located nearby, and actually this person turns out to live right at that intersection of those two areas, so we know this person is already there, so we're not deploying new people to the space. So one of the temptations is to say, well, why don't you just make this a crowd problem and ask people to send you in reports of what they see because you don't know what's happening at this intersection. Well, we can't do that because if we don't know what's going on and we send people there, we don't know what they're encountering, right? Um, and so this is why we have to be very concerned about how these even tiny, what seem like small interventions that's happening in other crowd sourcing situations have different applications here. Um, so anyway, but we can find this person. He's already there. I know it's a he. He's already there. Um, he might have other photos and other videos that he didn't think to post. Right? So that's more data. So it's not just the use of the Twitter data or the social media data, it's using it to find who you could use for providing data and not introduce more problems. I also would like to offer this as an example for how you can think about testing solutions that don't introduce additional problems. So when we're thinking about how you extract data rapidly, we can afford to get it wrong if we're doing geotechnical reconnaissance, but we still are taking up people's cycles, so it still has to be meaningful. It can't just be a play toy thing, right? But um, we can still get it wrong. If we don't have a representative sample, it's okay. We haven't, presumably, haven't hurt anybody. So a lot of people will ask me, well, if I'm building technology for disaster, how do I test it? Well, one of the things you might do is something like this, is testing it on a problem that will let you make sure it's working properly, whatever that solution might be, but not risking human life and limb. And there are other things to say about that, but I'm going to skip over that for now. Um, okay, so, but building solutions to really help attain situational awareness, this is, once I said, as I said earlier, the holy grail. Um, and this is because, of course, 
tweets, for example, as you might know, are by and large on their own, not individually contentful. They're there, I'm not saying they're not there, but they, they don't occur in, rapid, in large numbers, um, and they're hard to find. Um, and so this is the world's most perfect tweet, I think, in, in my opinion. We found it in 2009, and it's still my favorite tweet. Um, Twitter was different then a bit, so remember that the metadata was different. So this Twitterer is doing some really clever things here. She, um, we get the timestamp and date stamp for free, but she includes a link to a TwitPic, which is of this feature, which she tells us, she confirms, that it's a Red River in Winnipeg, which was under threat of flood. And it's north of the University of Manitoba, behind the law building in University College. So it's really precise locational information when she couldn't provide us with geocoding information. And I say provide us, I mean provide whoever, whomever she thought her audience was. Okay? And so we get the who, what, where, and this, this thoughtful person knew to confirm the when. So she was doing recipient design. So she wasn't presuming that just because she posted it on April 8th, that it was taken on April 8th. So she was really thinking about this as data. Likewise, if this was going to be retweeted, she didn't, she presumed her audience should not presume that it was taken, it wouldn't know when it was taken. So she attaches that information to this, to this, to this um, photo. So if we had lots and lots and lots of tweets like this, we might be able to solve the situational pro awareness problem next week through deriving data. But there are other things that are making this hard in addition to the absence of a lots of this kind of data. Is that, you know, social media data are mounting in volume every day. There's evolving styles of communication. There's mixes of languages in any one 140 character tweet. We see it in blogs and Facebook as well. Um, but there are also multiple hazards that occur on the planet at any one time. So when we were trying to distinguish between retweets of one earthquake and the retweets of another, it became very hard to do. So just in one random sample of a day where there was a big earthquake, 2012 Costa Rica earthquake, I gave an assignment to my students. I didn't have time to work through the homework assignment and I wanted them to answer some questions about retweeting behavior. Well, it turned out they couldn't do it because there were at least, at least 10 other earthquakes on the planet that day <laughs> that were being retweeted and tweeted about. Much more small, much smaller than the Costa Rica earthquake, but you couldn't tell easily without manual um, reading what retweets were associated with what. So this has become really challenging. So there's different automated processes that we and others, thankfully, around the world are trying to do, and, and also human computation is a part of this. But um, the problem continues to be hard because there was that perfect tweet I told you, uh, told you about, but here's a more typical tweet. Okay, so usually people laugh more when I show that tweet. You can laugh. Um, so this is a, really, this is a more typical tweet, um, but we should not be dismissive of this tweet. This tweet is actually quite valuable. It tells us a lot of information. You don't know that yet, but you will. So hold on to whatever thoughts you have, and we'll return to that tweet in a minute. So branch three brings us to how we collect social media data in response to disasters. So, um, and it's how, you, it's how you collect the data that you know that that was a valuable tweet beyond what it said. It was how you collect it. And that's why the collection of this is so much a part of the science of and the interpretation of what we do with our data. So um, the next slide is really the most profound result of all the re research we've done over a decade. So here it is. Okay, so actually, I know, aha, but we know this, right? So then why do we treat our data as though it's not? If you look at social computing research in general, not even just for disaster research, but especially where I live, I see it in disaster research all the time, we see that um, people are collecting on high signal stuff, right? Because, and, and this happens for any kind of big event, right? They're only collecting on the, it's, there's so much volume that they only, they have to choose what they're collecting on. So they're collecting on the high signal stuff and it ignores the context of the before or after. This happens in machine learning, this happens in human analysis. Um, you know, we'll have annotators only annotate tweet by tweet. Human computation tasks will also look at this tweet by tweet in absence of the before or after. We have done this, we're trying to to correct this problem by introducing new ways of looking at this 
but still have it be automated and supplementing our qualitative analysis. But this is what you see in the published record today, and it's a real problem, and it's going to prohibit our ability to move forward in ways that really start getting at what will, will become the more complex issues around disaster, as I'll show you in just a minute. So you would never do this in real life. You would never take a real sentence, one sentence out of context when you're passing by the hall and hearing all these people talk about different things. Um, but we do it here, and we do it especially with Twitter. So now we go back to this tweet. Now imagine you could be whatever you'd like to be. You could be a machine or you can be a human, whatever you'd like to imagine in your head. If you're a machine, you get 10,000 tweets delivered to you like this. If you're a human, you get 1,000 to annotate it. And this is presented to you, and it's all you had, just this content here. And you have to make judgments about whether it's on topic or off topic, if it's relevant or if it's truthful. And I'm betting that most of you would say you just can't know the answer to that, right? Especially because of the two euphemisms. We have a properly spelled verb, but it's the wrong verb. Um, so um, as I said, in context, this tweet turns out to be pretty informative. So I'm going to show it to you now in context. And I'd like to tell you why we're looking at this kind of thing, so, so you can imagine the problem that we're after. So one of the things that we're studying in our group right now with NCAR is how the public makes decisions about risk, a risk around coastal hazards in particular, and in particular hurricanes. So there's a whole line of inquiry around what is called protective decision making. So how do people perceive risk and how do they decide to evacuate? We know that even if they get eva an evacuation order, they won't necessarily evacuate. And that's because they're not, people are rational, but not rational in the way we think they are. So, so, so emergency responders and others get really upset like about, well, why didn't they just listen to the evacuation order? Well, it turns out maybe they can't evacuate. Maybe they are ill. Maybe they have, you know, a single mother with three children, or, um, you know, they don't have any money to go somewhere, or it turns out really going that way isn't a very good idea based on other information that they have. Um, and so what, there's this larger idea of how people take protective action, even if they can't evacuate. And then there's the question of when, how, what kind of protective action do they take before they actually decide to evacuate in, in, in face of this threat. So that's the general problem that we're trying to examine and use a social media record as a real-time log of, we hope, of these kinds of decisions. And we're, so we're trying to figure out if we can use it that way to get these, this kind of precision about where, when people make these decisions. So, okay, so here's our same guy, and he starts out with a tweet that says, people are really overreacting about this damn hurricane. So this is a very, now imagine again if you're a machine or a human and you're looking at just this in isolation. I think you would judge this to be on topic and relevant, okay? And we would catch it probably because of the word hurricane. Although a lot of us were not filtering on hurricane because it was too noisy for Hurricane Sandy, so we probably wouldn't have caught this tweet. But if it was presented to you, I think you would think it was valuable and we would think, oh, this person is dismissive, right? But then look, look what happens. So he says, I'm about to put my iPhone on the charger. That's all he tweets. If, it, if you, all you saw was this in isolation, you would not know if this had anything to do with the hurricane. You could not make a judgment about that. And then, because you're not seeing it in order. Then we get our deer flying in the sky tweet. And then we get our fourth tweet that, for me, personally resolves what happens before. So then here he says, I'm about to make something to eat before the power goes out. And I'm willing, as a human judge, with my human judgment to believe this has something to do with a hurricane. The power going out does that for me. It helps me resolve the iPhone on the charger is probably about power. And then it tells me that that deer flying in the sky tweet is a weather tweet, right? It's a weather report, right? And then, of course, also we see the turn in his, the change of his mind from people are overreacting about this damn hurricane to stuff is really out of control. I better charge in my phone and get some food, right? But... The classic way of collecting data in this space for these extreme events, lots of activity, is to collect on keywords. Maybe they're hashtagged, maybe they're not, but they're like as unique as possible, place names and all sorts of things. So this is the only time we capture this guy, is with this pink tweet, where he's writing to Governor Christie, who's a governor of New Jersey, one of the states that, that is affected. And he, there's no pronoun here, so it's actually kind of a funny... Knowing who he is, it's kind of a funny thing to do to write to the governor to ask, when is it safe again to head back home? So that clearly has something to do with the hurricane, but we are not sure if it has anything to do with his protective decision making, right? It's almost like he's act asking on behalf of others because of the way he phrased it and the way he's writing to Governor Christie. And then he finally says, 
and this is the only evidence we get, he says, it feels so great to be home. Sigh. So never did he say, and he's got a ton of tweets. I only gave you an excerpt. Never does he say, I'm evacuating, I'm getting out of here, I'm going home, I'm going away. Like phrases that you might think would be good phrases to detect evacuation or protective decision making, right? So um, we have to look at the whole of the stream to get some sense of what's going on. Why do we do this? Why do we continue? What is the allure in social computing research to look at things tweet by tweet or statement by statement? And I think it's this tyranny of the data structure that's doing it to us. And I'm really worried about this. Um, I think the tyranny of the data structure, in this case, the tyranny of the Twitter data structure compromises research design. We forget that it's actually dictating what it is that the tw kind of choices that we're making. And we must be really, really careful about this for all social computing research in general. So what do you do to solve this problem? Well, it's not automatically easy, but if you're dedicated to working in this, you've got to either do it or work with others who are tr or have the computational capability to first, first collect on keyword collection and then go through and you get your keywords, you get your tweets based on the keywords that you find. You find your users by having collected on those terms. You discover you have, you know, user three, for example, that said two things. And you, you're curious, well, I want to know what he or she said before or after. So then you go back, what we do is we go back and collect what we call the contextual streams. So we get all the streams of what they said before and after these found tweets. So the finding of the first tweets is just the first step. And then there's at least a second step in here. And then I'd like to, this helps us bridge into brand four is we do this for everybody or whatever sample it is that we decided that we needed to do this for based on whatever the criteria are. And this is just of course impressionistic but what I'm trying to show you is that this is where then all the interaction between other people lies. We need to have this data in order to see what it is people are doing with each other. And if all we do are collect on these words that we thought would be important then we really don't understand for example what it means to evacuate. So the problem, of course, is that the data just explode when you do this. It becomes unmanageable. And so one must have automated assistance in order to even get at eventually uh, content or qualitative or ethno, you know, virtual ethnographic analysis or whatever it might be that you might do with this. There's no question that you need some automated assistance. So we can't analyze it just linguistically because the linguistics aren't telling us enough. Um, so we need new techniques for data sampling. Um, and that includes um, filtering on what people do through non-linguistic behavior and social media and then looking at what they say to then build models from that. So let me give you some examples of that. And keeping in mind that like for Sandy, for example, there were five million people who participated in that conversation. And so to fi figure out who the evacuators were, of five million people, you must, you must absolutely have assistance. Anyway, so some of the things that we're looking at, that we have looked at and are looking at now, are, are, are these things. So um, when Kate Starbird and Grace Mujni were at Colorado, they were looking at um, follower deltas. So it was um, more telling to look at the change in follower count um, than to look at the initial follower count. So change in follower count was a good predictor of people who had very good information and therefore were actually closest to the ground. So it was a good predictor of people who were on the ground experiencing an event by looking at their follower deltas. Deltas. Pacing is another thing that we might, that we're starting to look at. So if somebody's tweeting, for example, a great deal and then suddenly, suddenly stops tweeting, well that tells you a lot about that person that suggests that you might want to investigate what's happening there. Or if they don't tweet very much at all and then suddenly they start tweeting a lot, that's another kind of signal. Um, geotagging switching is another thing that we're looking at. So when people choose to turn geotagging on and off, I think can tell you something about what the, what the audience is that they're trying to reach. And that is another dimension, another behavioral dimension that might be valuable. And then another thing that we're spending a lot of time on right now is this idea of movement derivation, which connects to the evacuation research I was telling you about. And the idea is here, again, to look at, among the very small number of people who do have geotagging on, can we figure out, by comparing to prior behavior, um, if they have evacuated or if they have sheltered in place. It turns out this is incredibly messy. It sounds like it should be just like a ding, 
Aha, uh -huh, but it's not. Uh, that's because people once, you know, they'll go to the shore and they'll take pictures and they'll go for coffee as they're really trying to figure out what should we do here. And they do all this kind of movement that sort of disguises itself as regular activity and turns out it's, it's connected to evacuation. So there's a, so there's a fair amount of work and inference that has to be done here. But the idea is, where we're going with this is, is that we can build, we can figure out who the evacuators are or predict who they might be through their movement behavior, and then we look at their linguistic behavior, build our, our theories, and then eventually our uh, machine classifier models based on that linguistic behavior, the people that we know we have found, and then you can imply, apply those classifiers to the much, much larger world of attention of those who participated without geocoding. So this is work that um, Jennings Anderson is leading, Kevin Stowe, Marina Kogan, and our NCAR colleagues. Another lesson we've learned in all of this, um, in this kind of attraction to deriving information and people having ideas about how disasters should be, right, the movie version of disaster, is um, to beware the lure of bad information. This is like the second stopping ground for people who want to work in this space. First, it's situational awareness, and when that turns out to be pretty hard, they say, well, you know what, I'll figure out where all the bad information is. And, um, and especially in hazards with exogenous agents. I mean, I think with endogenous agents, we have a different story going on, as I explained earlier. But this is, they presume this is also to be de to be equivalently true with ex exogenous agents. And I think it's a bit of a red herring. I think it's a hard problem to solve, but it's not that hard. It's, it's, it's the easiest of the hard problems. I worry instead about the hyper-locality and hyper-temporality of data. So um, data that's true for me, about where I might evacuate, might not be true for you in the back of the room. And we're as close as, you know, we can reasonably expect to be. And so I might have to evacuate this way, and you might have to evacuate that way. But by the way, I checked those doors, and those doors are locked, so you can't evacuate that way. So you might also have to evacuate this way. Um, the point is, is that even within very small amounts of spaces and um, the information that is true, right, this, this pursuit of is it true, so much research around, is social media data true, which is such a strange question to me, is we discover very quickly that it's a relative concept. Same with it, um, the temporality of data. So information that's, quote, true at time one is not true at time two. And being able to discern this data, we don't, aren't, don't have a way to figure out if this, you know, where is this bad actor coming from through IP, IP addresses or whatever else, that is really the critical problem. And we're starting to do some work in that area, um, but only just barely, and I really hope there are more people who continue to work in this space. Okay, so branch four. So branch four has to do with how the social structures arise, how social structures arise from the primordial soup of social media. So we've come to understand like how this happens by looking at different levels, different units of analysis, interpersonal group, organization, and institutional levels of analysis. And let me just kind of show this to you here. Here I'm very starkly representing the informal and the formal, emergency management and the public here. Um, I hope you realize this is kind of a, this is just for visual purposes, um, and it's the best I can do with my graphic skills. But anyway, the point is, is that these social structures arise out of, of, peop of how uh, people begin to share information with each other, and they witness others sharing information. That's this interpersonal unit of analysis where we want to know, much like I described earlier, what it is it that they're saying and how are they expressing themselves. Um, the second level of analysis is what addresses what happens next, which is when people start working together and they operate on and through the communications that they produce because remember, digital, those digital traces become the material upon which they can work. It, it becomes the site of production, right? So not only their own interactions, but the interactions that they're witnessing and seeing others do. And they, so they start newly mobilizing around digital digitally distributed information. Not everyone does this, but some will start seeing things happen and say, oh, I bet I could ask so-and-so, I bet I ask this person about where I could get this supply, or could I borrow that generator, or do they know something about this piece of information? Do they know where somebody is? Or I saw somebody needed help with antibiotics, I've got antibiotics, let me start doing this. Let me start helping here. And so what happens is, is that these groups start forming and developing, and some really develop into serious groups. Sometimes they last 
for days, sometimes they last for weeks, sometimes they last just for hours, but they try to accomplish something. And these are these grassroots groups, and this completely parallels what we see happening in the physical space. And Krebs and Bosworth speak about this very nicely, looking at the 100-year history of disaster events. And this gets us to this organizational level of analysis. And then where I think some really interesting questions are emerging now that we, and I hope others will be investigating, is that we're starting to see shifts, of course, in these information relationships within the whole of the institution of emergency management. So we can't ignore what is happening from tweet, from the level of tweet, all the way up to the institution of emergency management, and we, we follow it, but this is the trail we follow and how we get there. Okay, so as I said, those people once found, if they find each other through the expression of their questions and answers and concerns that they express on social media, they'll sometimes start working together, just as they do in the physical world. And this quote um, that was from work that Kate Starbird and I published back in 2011 about the uh, Haiti earthquake, I think, explains this really well. And one of our subjects wrote to us and said, in the beginning, I worked alone. I started recognizing people, this is on Twitter, who seemed to have good information, and we would support each other, we'd retweet each other, and we'd help find information for each other. And then um, one of her um, colleagues in all of this, a person who became a colleague because they were one of the people who found each other, says eight days after the event, says, I am stunned. We've gotten supplies in. We've saved people from the rubble. We've brought them doctors. We have best team. We are Von Twitterers. And they go on to call themselves Von Tweeters and Crisis Tweeters. And the, a subset of this group then went on to further formalize into a nonprofit organization. And it was one story of not an, a large number, but a significant number of groups that did this kind of formalization. They developed, it was almost like a cottage industry that arose out of these new opportunities for these volunteer technical communities, as they call themselves, to emerge and operate in disaster in new ways. OpenStreetMap is a large organization that you might know about. It's known as the Wikipedia of Maps. And they too, this was a different, this is a slightly different story, but it followed a similar trajectory. So they already existed, right? They already had a purpose of generating geospatial data that was open and available for a number of purposes. So um, the OSM community themselves internally mobilized in the wake of Haiti. Um, if you remember, many government buildings were destroyed, many government officials were killed. There was a real need for geospatial data. This is what OpenStreetMap looked like uh, the day before the earthquake. There's very little um, content, and I don't know if you can see, you maybe can see this, there's a great deal of content now here. I don't know if you can see it on this slide, um, this projected version of the slide, 21 days after the event. So the whole, the country was really mapped at a very, very high level of detail. Um, in work um, that Robert Soden and Jennings Anderson and others did, we found that there were 446 mappers. 83 of them were brand new, but they were already OSM mappers. And so, and then we saw the same behavior happen four years later in the Philippines in preparation for, and then in the wake of Typhoon Yolanda Haiyan. And um, Robert, this is the paper that I mentioned earlier that Robert Soden will be speaking about um, later in the week about how and why the patterns of mapping actually look quite different. These colors represent different users here um, between these two events, even though the phenomena were very similar. And it was a technical consequence of a new mapping innovation that supported mapping. But he, he will talk about how it comes about through this idea of OSM seeing itself as a, as a different kind of player in this larger ecosystem of data production and data reuse. So it's really a story of institutional change um, that gets realized, of course, in these technological and social innovations. Um, and uh, the way we see it is that OSM as a data producing organization was responding to lots of external pressures in the sort of um, in, given that they're, they've experienced a great deal of success in achieving what they wanted to become a source of good geospatial data, they then have this obligation, I think, is how they see themselves to then think about how do they deliver that data to others. And so this is what you see, I think, in this, in this change that's happening with OSM. So come Thursday, last session, last talk, it'll be worth it, uh, room E4. Um, we're doing a, a little bit more work in this area, too, around the analytics of OSM. We're trying to open up the database, which is, again, another kind of tyranny of the database, tyranny of the data structure, tyranny of the database, where unlike Wikipedia, as Robert will explain, OSM can't 
see itself very well. It's not like Wikipedia where you have all this documentation with talk pages and history pages where we can study what those collaborations look like. It's very, very hard to do with OSM because the database is impenetrable. So Jennings Anderson, Robert Soden, Ken Anderson, Marina Kogan, Tom Ye, Mikhail Marin um, are working on this and we have some open source code now available to be able to look at the user centered view of who is making uh, edits to the map and how much and when and all of that. And this work is being presented this week actually in Chicago by Jennings at the American Association for Geographers. Okay, my last branch. Okay, this is good. I'm almost there. Okay, so um, <laughs> one of the um, so one of the things I mentioned is one of the criticisms that's been leveled at us, and I think it's been it's great, right? It gives us a chance to respond. So now I, Volker Wolf, where are you? Are you here? Oh, I can say things about him. He's not here. I know he's here, but he's not here. Um, so he has been, I think, especially critical, but it's been very productive uh, for us about saying, you know, this is all, you know all this stuff that's happening online, but what, what relevance does it have to what's happening on the ground? And is there any relevance? And I think the answer is yes, and I'm not, not, this is not speaking out of advocacy, but I think the challenge in studying it well means that we can't, if we can't study it well, then we have no right to write a paper about it that doesn't tell you what that looks like because it's a very hard thing to study, right? You have to, I think the connections have been very kind of ephemeral and tiny and minor, right? Um, no, I shouldn't say minor, they're important, but they're, we know of course people look at things online, they get help from people online, they can't quite remember if they got it from their friend on Facebook or when they saw their neighbor on the street, you know, later that day. They can't make those kinds of connections, it's hard to study that in a way that makes it anything meaningful to say to you. Um, but what I think we are seeing is that as these events are unfortunately happening and as these social structures are starting to have some persistence sometimes and then are starting to replicate themselves and people are starting to see patterns or discovering it anew, they're being exposed to other ways in which people are using social media in other kinds of environments and they extend that really quickly to what's happening in um, this disaster that they're experiencing. They are, there is more transfer, more of a relationship between what's happening, nominally speaking, offline and online, that then therefore becomes studyable. We can witness it now, because it's extended, it has some kind of duration. So now we can study it. It also means sometimes you have to be in the right place at the right time to study it. And this is once again where the floods we had in Colorado made it possible for us just to be there to know what, what to study. Um, the other answer I have to that criticism that's, uh, is that we must design and create those opportunities, those connections as well. And so that goes back to the, both the summative and formative research that I argued in the beginning that is in play here, right? So it's a design intervention. So I'm going to touch on just a few examples before I close. So um, do we have till 340? What do we have till? 350. Oh. Oh darn, okay, so, okay, so um, we, uh, so in work led by Joanne White, we looked at, um, again, in response to our floods, the evacuation of 38 horses that were marooned, horses can be marooned on a mountaintop, you don't have to be on an island, you can be on a mountaintop, and you're marooned when all the roads going out are no longer passable. Um, and so um, in her dissertation work, she looks at how this ensemble of people who could only meet virtually because they were not in Colorado, many of them, they were not on this mountaintop, um, was, came together and was able to cast this kind of wide net for this expertise around what it means to be a horse person, um, to be able to figure out this unusual problem of evacuating 38 horses down mountain, a three hour journey down to a new ranch. Um, and so the story goes is that the um, expertise, the intersubjective knowledge that expertise shares enabled a degree of trust around strangers that enabled the preliminary support of remote planning with many unknowns, but was still subject to error and hyperbole. And that's often where the social media activity gets dismissed. They said, well, it's not 38 horses. You told us it was 50. And so what silliness is happening online here in social, social media land? Well, so they have this error. It gets propagated. Lots of things happen around it. But then what happens is once they come onto site after a big orchest orchestration, once again, this problem gets mitigated once again through their expertise, through online witnessing of the, or on-site witnessing of the inventory, their own materiality of work and demonstration of their own expertise, which reestablished credibility and then kind of put, re-measured what the response should be. 
We're developing crowdsourcing systems around lost and found issues. We are working a great deal in the American West. This goes to the designing the interventions and working with the state of Colorado on their own experiment of Aaron how to include volunteers in responses to natural hazards. We're not getting into law enforcement stuff, but around natural hazards. And then most recently, we're turning to the topic of resilient infrastructures and resilient communities. And this once again opens up the opportunities for a diverse um, disciplinary commitment to this topic. So we are working with civil engineers, environmental designers, decision scientists, urban planners, both at the University of Agder in Norway, where I have an affiliation, as well as the University of Colorado. And so this, again, speaks to this kind of diversification of what HCI research can be. So those are the five branches of crisis informatics research as I see it today. About to close now. So just bear with me. Okay, thank you. So, okay, so as you can see, disasters are the sites of human innovation. Victims are creative, helpers are creative, responders are creative, and researchers must be creative and vigilant and respectful and integrative of so many different forms of investigation. And all of that is, I would argue, is what HCI researchers, researchers are so good at doing. We are hard workers, I think. We want to tackle very hard problems. Um, and I think it's possible for us in HCI to accomplish a great deal on behalf of many. It is possible to manage both the applied without losing any commitments to the basic scholarship that also drives research in, in the most essential ways. And I think it's, in fact, what scholarship demands of us today. So I propose that together we consider in our research going forward, how can our HCI work have greater social impact? And I propose to you and to me, is it a matter of expanding the base of collaborations for more intellectual diversity? And are we sure that the research we are doing isn't being foiled by the very technologies, the new technologies that we're encountering? Um, are we being pulled in by its imperatives, making us unwittingly complicit in technological determinism? And can we return to basic HCI tenets and constructs that help guide our understanding of behaviors that are becoming differently complex in the face of all this new innovation? And finally, imagine the powerful things that can happen when HCI leads. Thank you very much for your attention. I didn't leave much time for questions. I'm so sorry. Well, we started a little bit late, and I'm here for other questions. We have two minutes. Lauren says we have two minutes, so two questions. <laughs> Hello, um, thank you for the talk. Uh, my name is Jasmine Jones. I'm a, a third year PhD student at University of Michigan. Um, mm. My question is about the, um, the kind of the epistemological issues. Can that you speak mentioned. just a little louder for Sorry. me? My uh, question is about some of the epistemolog epistemological issues you mentioned um, with the separation between exogenous and endogenous um, agents. And I was wondering uh, if you had any thoughts on situations that might be a mixture of both. I'm thinking about like the Ebola crisis where it was kind of this big exogenous issue, but there was also this issue of quarantine, which kind of made it. Yeah, not so much. great. That's a great example. I think I thought about that one. And Jasmine, weren't you at Colorado for a little while when you were an undergraduate? Yes. Yeah, great. Nice to see you again. So the thing about Ebola is that, and p other kinds of pandemics, is that, of course, it's other, but it's inhabited by people. So it becomes this endogenous agent, right? So it becomes like, you know, tracking who is inhabiting the agent. We anthropomorphize that. So I would say that would behave a lot like an endogenous agent, um, in, in my opinion. But of course, there's still then, I mean, and there might be, you know, there isn't just one single answer to it, too. We might, depending on the way where, whatever research question we have about this, we might need to play with the frame, right, about whether it's important to think about it for this research question as an exogenous agent, for example, versus others as an endogenous agent. I would say I didn't do much social media research on that, but just kind of very casually looking at anecdotally what was going on. I would say that the kind of behaviors we were seeing in social media were, were very much more aligned with endogenous, in the U.S., sorry, in the U.S., we're very much aligned with this kind of endogenous way of thinking around about the agent that we have to apprehend and watch and, you know, study and figure out who's responsible for, you know, letting the nurse walk out of the hospital or something. So that would be my answer to that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. 
Hi, um, enjoyed your talk a lot. John Thomas from Problem Solving International. <laughs> so I'm wondering what you think about global climate change. I realize that it's happening over a long period of time, but yeah. maybe in terms of our ability to do the things that are necessary in order to impact it, maybe it is a crisis and maybe some of the things in crisis informatics really need to be brought to bear. Yeah, you know, so sure. I think, yeah, why, of course. Um, and um, I, I do, you know, and this is where the, there's, okay, so a couple things. There's, there's always, I struggle with the limits of English and crisis and disasters and emergencies and what we call things and how things fall in or out of that because we have to label them. Um, I think for sh I think the attention that the field is moving in is attending to the outcomes of cl climate change. So it's attending currently to the um, the strength of hurricanes and the damage that it can do. It's um, and we struggle with how to deal with even things like drought, which are also a, a protracted and prolonged and an outcome of climate change. But it's unclear how to, it's unclear that the social computing frame is the thing we should put to that. We might be looking at that differently. We might be looking at, for example, um, changing behavior, right, and incentivizing behavior to do, to behave differently. I would say, at least in the, in, in the contributions that we've been able to make, the limit, our work is, does have its limits for sure, um, we have not looked, we have not tried to um, change behavior um, as a result of these kinds of threats. But I think that ability, that, does, that need to change behavior, as we see in other forms of HCI, like people becoming more green and exercising more and all this, that could absolutely find a place here, which is why I so often try to bring many people to the fold here and try to describe, I try to explain that disaster is not a niche problem. It cuts across all aspects of human society, all aspects. Um, and, and it's a great place to be thinking about these problems where people don't have the horizon is just so far out. So I think it's possible, but I don't think there's a huge amount of work being done in that area. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Okay.